Wow, that's all I can say. Listening to that music made me want to spike my Bible, but I didn't know if that'd be appropriate or not. I was a little late this morning. Jack had to wait on me, which you know what that'll be like when you get in the car, you know, that he had been waiting for me. And I just said the only thing that, you know, I could say, I'm sorry, I had to make sure I'd taken all my vitamin C, all right, just so you know. Because I knew C, D, I'm not through. <laughs> you, ladies and gentlemen, 40 years I've gone through this. Scars, in my, but I'm, I'm not the kind to bring it up. <laughs> but it is a privilege to be back home. Preston Wood was our home for many years. My wife, Diane, and our two daughters, Chris and Melissa, uh, we love Preston Wood. And I'd like to say that I, during the COVID shutdown, lockdown, uh, kind of reminded me of being in a detention center, but uh, during all of that, I'd love to say, man, we were tuning in to PowerPoint. But the truth is, we always watch PowerPoint. We get it taped. And when I leave town, I make sure I got the ball games taped. You know, you got to have priorities. Amen, guys. You know what I'm saying. Got the right team most of the time. Uh, that game taped, and, uh, and, but I always tape PowerPoint. So this has been a part of our life and reminds us of what incredible things the Lord is doing here and around the world. And if you're a good friend of somebody, like I am uh, privileged to be of your pastor, there's nothing worse than being in New York City and all of a sudden, the valet or the, the gentleman getting taxis at the hotel goes, are, are, you, are you Dr. Graham? Are you Jack Graham? And I'm going, okay, this is staged. Jack came out, gave the guy a little extra tip, said, I'm going to be out here. I just knew it was. But I've been with him in about 10 cities. And even in my hometown, Orlando, he gets in a car with an Uber driver, and he starts talking about PowerPoint. I'm going, man, this is a bit much. So we love PowerPoint. Thank you for what it means literally around the world and across the country. If you have your Bible, I know some of us have ours memorized, but if you have your Bible, I'm going to ask you to turn with me to the book of Exodus, the book of Exodus. And I have lost the equivalent of two Backstreet Boys, uh, Lance and Joey, I believe. But if you knew you were going to be preaching and Dr. Cooper was going to be in the audience, you'd get motivated too, okay? That's all, I, all I've got to say. But as I stand today, I want to ask you a question. What do you do when you don't know what to do? What do we do when we really don't have a clue? It seems like lately, almost all, we've heard many jokes about 2020. I saw a text on Friday. It says, oh, my heavens, it's Friday the 13th in 2020. I mean, that's, that's just kind of eerie, is it not? But I want you to know many of us who love the Lord, have been faithful, study, do our best to serve him and honor him, but there are times even in our lives when we don't know what to do. So what do we do when the future is unknown? I like to describe it as scuba diving at night with a bad light. If you've ever been a night dive and you've got a, a rental light and you can see about that far in front of you, it kind of changes your uh, perspective a little bit, especially at night when certain things come out to boogie, all right? So... Uh, but what do we do when we don't know what to do? So I want to share with you from God's Word, and I'm going to ask you, let's turn to chapter 14. The book of Exodus, of course, tells us the incredible story about the call of Moses. And I want to remind you that Moses had been in several tight spots, several difficult moments, several times in his life. And Moses had, been, had the hand of God on him. He had been protected. You remember his very name, Moses, means one who was drawn out of the river. And of course, that's a reference to the fact 
that Pharaoh was killing all of the male Jewish children and a loving mother with a newborn son said, I cannot let Pharaoh kill my son. And he put him, she put him in a basket and floated him down the Nile. Now, if you want to have a sense how desperate the times were, according to Herodotus, the father of history, the Nile at that time was the most crocodile-infested body of water in the world. You could walk across the Nile no matter how wide it was or flood season. You could walk across the Nile on the back of the crocodiles. So can you imagine a mother putting her newborn in a in a, a, a ark made out of bulrushes and uh, branches and pushed him down the Nile. And as only God could do, Pharaoh's daughter was bathing, had one of her attendants because they heard something was moving and they could see and something was crying uh, in the basket. And so they had it brought to shore and it was Moses and he was raised in Pharaoh's household. So Pharaoh began to make everything available to Moses. He was educated in the finest sciences in the world. The largest library in the world was in Alexandria. He received an education in math and science that very few on the earth had received. So he had gone from being almost destroyed and then miraculously delivered. But as he began to grow up, He learned of his heritage. He wanted to see his family. And while there, or see his kinsmen, he saw an Egyptian harassing and whipping and scourging a Hebrew. And he knew in his heart, I'm Pharaoh's son. I've been raised in his palace, but I'm a Hebrew. And that was a secret, of course, that he had. And guess what happened? All of a sudden, he began to just well up with anger because take whatever image you have of slavery, whether it's a book description or a movie or a television series, some of the horrendous, horrible things we've learned about slavery. And you take that and multiply it by about 100 times. That's what Pharaoh was doing to the Hebrews. And all of a sudden, Moses saw it with his own two eyes And he jumped in and intervened, and a fight broke out, and he struck the man, and the Egyptian died. Well, Moses now is in a crisis. He has killed a man. He's hopeful that no one knows about it. But the next day, he saw two Hebrews, two Jews, fighting among themselves. And he said, what's wrong with you? Aren't aren't things tough enough for you without you harming each other? And one of the Hebrews said, who are you to tell us what to do? You're going to kill us like one of us, like you did the Egyptian. And then Moses knew it was known. And Moses fled. So when you talk about Moses at the Red Sea, you and I must understand he had been in several very difficult, very tight spots. And he had to wander in the desert. And he was sitting beside a spring And some folks came by, and then some others came by to harm the women and rob them of all their possessions. And Moses stepped in and defended them. That led to Moses being welcomed in that village. And soon that led to Moses having a family. And one day while he was tending the flocks, he saw a burning bush. A bush was burning there in Exodus 3. It was on fire, but yet it wasn't consumed. And Moses said, what in the world? And he said, went to see what was, how is this possible? And yet as he got close, suddenly there was a voice, Moses, Moses, take off your sandals for where you're standing is sacred ground. So I want us to know, before we read God's word and ask him what do we do when we don't know what to do, now I'm not asking you to take off your shoes because that's not just uh, exactly what God told him, literally, but it's also a great insight for us. Before we can approach, before we can understand, before we can look into things that we don't know and we don't understand that are being revealed to us, 
We've got to make sure we take off our sandals. We've got to have the right attitude. You've got to be willing to take off that dirty garments that are in our mind and put on some clean garments. If you want God to speak to you today about what to do in a time when, frankly, no one we know really even knows what to do, then I would ask you, let's begin today with asking him to clean our mind, Help us to realize it's holy ground to see his word and to realize that Moses in that crisis was called by name. You know what God said to Moses? Moses, I know you. I see you. I care about you and I'm going to use you to deliver the children of Israel from under Pharaoh. And that began the story. So we pick it up, Exodus chapter 14, and look look down at verse 5. Exodus 14, verse 5. Now remember, Genesis is the book of beginning. Exodus means exit. It's them being delivered, the children of Israel being delivered. They were in Egypt for hundreds of years. Leviticus, the very next book, you know the book with all the rules, the thou shalt and the thou shalt nots, and all the ceremonial laws and cleansing laws. You know what Leviticus was all about? Exodus was getting the children of Israel out of Egypt. Leviticus was trying to get Egypt out of the children of Israel. So when I talk about us getting on holy ground and and asking the Lord to change our mood or change our attitude and open our eyes, I want you to realize that God's trying to get a lot of the stuff inside us out. So now we begin reading chapter 14, verse 5. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds about the people. They said, what have we done? We've released Israel from serving us. So he got his chariot ready and took his troops with him. He took 600 of his best chariots, all the rest of the chariot and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers in each one of them. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And so he pursued the Israelites. And notice what it says in verse 8 of chapter 14. It describes how the children of Israel began the exodus. It describes their attitude. Notice what it says. Now, the version I'm reading says, and they who were going out triumphantly. Now, the Hebrew Bible says they were going, the literal Hebrew says they were going out defiantly. Man, that's what I'm talking about. God has shown Pharaoh. Remember all the plagues that had taken place? God had pushed each one of those false Egyptian deities off their pedestal. So when the sun went dark, Ra was the all-powerful God, the main God. And Hapi was the goddess of the Nile, and it turned to blood, and the locust. I mean, so every single plague was God proving there are no other gods but me. And so the children of Israel, they left defiantly it says in the hebrew god showed pharaoh we're out of here we're going the version i'm reading says they left triumphantly you remember the king james version i love the rendering you know what it says and they began their journey with a high hand now i don't know if they were giving the lord high fives i don't know if they were giving each other high fives but i love that phrase So they began their journey, and they were pumped, and they were excited. And all of the Egyptians and Pharaoh's horses and chariots and his army chased after them and caught them. And it says they were camped by the sea beside pi Hatharah and in front of Baal Zephon. Now, can I be honest with you? I I am dyslexic, and so uh, very dyslexic. And a little A, D, 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 D. I think they added a few Ds for drama. Some people are very dramatic. But uh, anyway, but I want you to know and understand that when when I began to uh, uh, try to figure out these hard names, so when I was preaching as a teenager, 
I would say they were camping right beside hard name number one and just between hard name number two. And that's what we call a literal translation, all right? Now, why in the world, and I take a moment, but I think it's critical. Why in the world do we have such minute little details? Well, number one, we are told in chapter 13, we are told that God told Moses exactly where they were to camp. So the children of Israel, remember when all of a sudden they're surrounded, they're in a cul-de-sac, but they're camped right where God told Moses to take the children of Israel. So I always want you to remember, you may want to write this down if you've got a pen, pencil, lipstick, mascara, but I want you to just make a note. God will lead you out of where he's led you in. He will never forsake you. He will never abandon you. He'll never walk away from you. They were right. God knew where they were, and they were right where God told them to go. But you know what the latitude and longitude, you know what that means, the hard names? It's the word latitude and longitude. You see that God tells you exactly on a map where they were, where this happened. Sometimes there are those of us, and primarily because of much of our educational system, we're taught, well, the Bible uh, has some great stories. The Bible, but it's not a historical account. And it's not a book of science, and it's not a book of medicine, and it's not this, and it's not that. And they try to water down and diminish the Bible that's here by the breath of God. But the Bible tells us wherever the Scripture says there was a mountain, there's a mountain. Whenever the Scripture says, and there was a valley that went through those those two mountains, and the valley was called, guess what? There's a valley between the two mountains. When the Bible says, and Abraham built an altar, Isaac built an altar, Jacob built an altar, all the places it gives us a reference of people building an altar, we have found ancient altars at that very site. So simply put, where God says there's a river, there's a river. These are real people, folks, in a real situation when they knew not what to do. They were listening to God through God's man, and they were obeying him. And you say, Jay, they began their journey with great boldness, great enthusiasm. I know when I first gave my life to Jesus, you know, I, my, my story of going through six broken homes as a kid, I know what it's like to be abandoned. I know what it's like to chase a dad and, and, and beg him not to leave or, or chase a stepdad and try to catch up at every stop sign, uh, at every red light, but he would speed through the stop signs. I know what it's like to go through a lot of abuse, physical, emotional, and sexual. And plus, because I was so dyslexic, we never found that out until I was in college. I'd been turned down by 13 colleges, thank you very much. And one college in Charleston took a chance on me, and guess what? While there, they said, Jay, something's not right. I've heard that a lot in my life, but something's not right. You score below plant life. Now, that's my terminology in in most subjects, but every now and then you'll score off the charts. So either you're cheating or there's something wrong. They found out I was dyslexic. And you know, one of the reasons I was called stupid and dumb because I couldn't read. I'm convinced one reason I ended up being a junkie and busted six times and and, and, in six different detention centers So I've been through six broken homes, six foster homes, and six juvenile detention centers. So when I hear the number 666, I get a little nervous, all right? Whether it's in the future or in the the rearview mirror, all right? So as a young guy, I just want you to know, when I heard the message of Jesus, now I was this junkie, and I tried to quit a hundred times, methamphetamine, meth crystal, and... I heard a message that was too good to be true, the message of Jesus, that he loved me, that he cared for me, that he wanted to come into my life. And I want you to know that he promised that he would never leave me or forsake me. He took me through withdrawal. I found out that God is not only Savior, Jesus is Deliverer. 
And he delivered me when I tried to quit a hundred times. And so I know what it's like to be set free. I know what it's like to not only hear something that's too good to be true and then find out it's oh so true. I hope you found that out. I don't mean, you know, your wife keeps saying, you know, honey, this is true. And and, and, uh, and our parents saying, I hope you know personally. And that night, I personally invited Jesus to come into my life, and he came. And I began my journey, what? With a high hand. I began my journey with enthusiasm because I knew God had done something in me, for me, and I was following him. So the children of Israel began triumphantly. But then notice what happened. As Pharaoh approached, the children of Israel, the Israelites, looked up and saw the Egyptians coming after them. And the Israelites, excuse me, they went from being triumphant to, it says in verse 10, they were terrified. They went from optimistic and joyful and bold to scared and frightened and beyond that, terrified. Oh my goodness, we're trapped. There's no way to go. The Red Sea is behind us and the mightiest army on the face of planet Earth at that time, the mightiest army in all of history up till that time was pursuing them and all they took with them was what they could carry in their hands. And there they all were, trapped. Now, you know why they began their journey also with, a, with a enthusiasm and a high hand and boldly? If you look up in chapter 13, the last two verses, I want you to see how this journey took place. Verse 21, 22 of chapter 13. The Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to lead them on their way during the day and in a pillar of fire to give them light at night so they could travel day and night. And the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night never left its place in front of the people. You know why they began their journey, folks, ladies and gentlemen? They kept their eyes on, in, in, in the daytime on the pillar of cloud, the Shekinah glory of God. And they followed that pillar. At night, it became a pillar of fire. And as soon as they were strong enough and they ate, they ate and they had some, uh, enough uh, sleep, they'd get up even in the darkness and follow that pillar of fire. But something happened. All those up at the front, all those that were, I mean, enthusiastic and excited, they were only looking forward. But there's always a few folks. Excuse me, I don't mean to say over here. It just happened that way. And, and remember, I'm dyslexic, so really I'm trying to, you know, you know what I mean. All right, so, but guess what? All of a sudden, they're here in the back, and guess what? Those in the back, they're not looking at the presence of God. They're kind of murmuring among themselves. It's hot. I got sand in my sandals. I got uh, stones in my sandal. This is a hard journey. Where are we going? We don't even know. And all of a sudden, they began to see as they look backwards, a different cloud, a cloud of dust. You know why the Bible bothers to mention all, the exact number of chariots and the exact number of, you know, all of those details? Because now all of a sudden there is a pillar of dust. Probably would block out the sun. They're going through the largest desert just about on planet Earth, and they're the largest army on planet Earth. And as they were going at full speed, the dust, and so here they were. You have to make a choice. They had to make a choice. Are we going to follow the pillar of fire and the pillar pillar of cloud? Are we going to keep our eyes on what? The noise and the dirt and the dust that's coming from the rear. So every day when you don't know what to do and you want to know what to do, I would ask the Lord to help me keep my eyes on Him and not the critics and not the circumstances and not all the gloom and doom and false report, all the stuff going on around us. I would trust that you would want to keep your eyes on Him. Now notice what it says. They now are terrified because of that pillar of dust. They cried out to the Lord for help. Now, that's appropriate. 
when you don't know what to do, cry out to him. But they said to Moses, Moses, is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you took us to die in the wilderness? Why have you done this to us, bringing us up out of Egypt? Is this not what we told you in Egypt? We told you, leave us alone so that we can serve the Egyptian. See, it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. Now, ladies and gentlemen, listen to me. I'm going to teach you a Hebrew phrase quickly. That's why I said get out pen, pencil, lipstick. I'm going to say it phonetically. I want you to write it. It's just a couple, a couple words, but I promise you, you will need this. You ready? You want to know what that verse literally is saying? Liar, liar, pants on fire. Do I need, li, over here, liar, liar, pants on fire. They never once said, Moses, we want to stay here. And you know, you, you, whenever they got mad at the Lord, who did they go to? They go to God's man. Why have you done this? Moses was minding his own business. God called him by name, the burning bush, all the miracles, the plague. But now they forgot that. Moses, this is your fault. And I want you to know, they hit below the belt. They were fighting dirty. What's the one country in the history of the world known for burials and tombs and embalmings, graves? Egypt, you know what they're saying? Oh, I guess, Moses, they ran out of room to bury us in Egypt. So you drug us out here in the middle of nowhere so we could be killed and destroyed and buried and forgotten. So they became terrified, and they said, Moses, let's go back to Egypt. You want to know what to do when you don't know what to do? Number one, you can go backwards. Go back to an old lifestyle, go back to an old attitude, go back to old habits, go back to old mistakes, same old, same old. If you don't know what to do, but I don't really think that's a real option, do you? It wasn't for me. My life, I had no family, no father, no future. I had zippity doo da. I didn't want to go backwards. The only hope I had was to go forward and trust the Lord. And then notice what Moses said. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid, stand firm, stand still, and see the Lord's salvation. He will prove to you today, for the Egyptians that you see today, you'll never see again. The Lord will fight for you, but you must be quiet. <laughs> now listen, that sounds like a pretty powerful word. I mean, that's from the preacher. Be still. Trust God, be quiet, calm your spirit. But there's, so an option is when you don't know what to do, stay still, just stand still. There's only one problem with those first two options. It's because of what the Lord says in verse 15, look at it. And the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to break camp and tell them to follow you and lift up your rod and stretch it out over the sea and the sea will part and I'm going to receive glory because Pharaoh and the chariots are going to pursue you and then when we get to the other side, all of a sudden the water's going to come back. And by the way, look at verse 19 as we close. The angel of the Lord who was going in front of the Israelite forces moved and went behind them. Can I be honest with you? There are times we really feel like we can see the Lord, hear the Lord, sense the Lord. True? But sometimes, even when we're trying to see him and hear him and follow him, it's almost like the cloud is not like it was. You know what the Bible teaches me when I don't know what to do? Jay, when you can't see me leading the way, that means I'm probably behind you, protecting you from something coming from the rear. So ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know if you don't know what to do, I'm going to challenge you to go forward, to challenge the Lord, to challenge him and trust him and say, Lord, I give my life to you. I give my heart to you. I give my circumstances to you. I give 
my, I give my life, which is sometimes a mess and sometimes I get that together. But Lord, all that I am, I give to you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want to close with a brief thing that happened to me. I'm in a detention center for about six months. For some reason, no fault of my own, I'm sure I was in solitary. And I looked out that little tiny window and I saw a full moon and I, got, I was angry. You know, I was all over the map emotionally. I was a dumpster fire in my life because I'd made a mess of my life and dug the hole I was in with my own two hands. Now, I had some other folks helping me. You know, a lot of things happened in my life. wasn't fair or right or whatever, but the bottom line was I'm in a mess. And I look out that window and I'm going, God, are you even there? Do you even exist? And God, if you do exist... Do you even know me? Do you even see me? You know, I'm the guy that had real long hair, and then every time I get busted, they shave it all off. I was trying to describe myself to God so he could pick me out. And I'm going, God, you know, are you there? Are you real? Do you even care about me? Do you even see me? Do you even hear me? Several days later, I was released. I don't know why, nobody really explained, but all of a sudden, you're released. And it was, you know, no cell phones, none of that. I had, couldn't call mom or do anything. She was at work, wouldn't get off work till late. And so I hitchhiked to the beach. There was a surfboard leaning up against a building, and I borrowed that surfboard. And I paddled out to catch a wave. First time in months, I had sunshine. I mean, really, I mean, I was like, man. And a guy pulls up, I see him on shore, pulls up, gets on his board, paddles out to me, looks me in the eye, and he says, Jay Strack, you don't know me, but I know you. A couple years older than you, so I know all about you and some of the stuff you've gone through and how you are. But he said, Jay, please, I don't have time to explain. I'm already running very late. But when I saw you come, and I saw you borrow that board, and I saw you get in the water, guess what? He said, as I was in the car driving over the bridge, Jesus spoke to me and said, I want you to go back and tell that young guy on the surfboard something. And he said, Jay, I don't expect you to understand that, and I don't really understand it. I know the Lord. He's changed my life, and he told me to tell you this. He does exist. He does see you, he knows you, and he cares deeply for you. He said, I've got to go, forgive me. And, and I couldn't ask any questions. I never saw that guy again the rest of my, so far in my life. And I want you to know, three days later, I'm invited to a Bible study. And I hear the message that proved to me that God does exist that he knows me. He calls you by name. And he cares for you. And he hears you and he sees you. And isn't that really all we could ask is to know that the God, the creator, sees me, knows me, wants me, loves me. Amen. And that night, in that Bible study, the young guy said, every head bowed, every eye closed, closed our head, closed our eyes, and he asked a question. How many of you tonight would like to know that you know that you know that you know if you die tonight, you go to heaven? How many of you tonight understand that Jesus, the one who died on the cross, and the one who was buried, and the one who rose from the dead, he did that so that hell could be shut, your sins could be forgiven, and you could be made brand new. He said, I want you to know you can't be ashamed of Jesus. He loves you, but he wants you to come to him. He wants you to make a stand for him. And the young guy leading the Bible study said, every head bowed, every eye closed. And so I bowed my head and closed my eyes, and he asked, how many of you tonight, since God is speaking to you, calling you, how many of you tonight would like to give your heart and life to Jesus? And I did what anyone would do in that situation. I peeked. <laughs> and I wasn't even Baptist, but I peeked. And you know what I saw? I saw teammates 
guys that had partied with me. I saw folks that I'd been in fights with. I saw girls I dated. I saw it was a room full of young people. And guess what? There were about 13 hands that went up. And just then, the young preacher said, every head bowed, every eye closed. You know how preachers are. So I bowed my head again. He said, now listen, you don't, you don't make a decision because of who else in the room makes a decision. You don't wait and look around to see who else is on the stand. If you want Jesus, his mercy, his love, his forgiveness, and his promise of a new life, you stand. And I peeked again. And no one was standing, not one. A moment earlier, a lot of hands, no one stood. And I said, dear God, if you'll let one person stand, I'll stand and give my life to you. And God said, Jay, if you want me, you stand, whether anybody else stands or not. And Jay Strike's never been real smart, and Jay Strike's never been real tough. But I did the smartest, toughest thing I've ever done in my life. I stood. I was the only one to stand at first. Before the night was over, some 13 others stood as well. And I went home that night with Jesus in my heart, flushed the drugs, flushed the booze, Jesus walked with me through withdrawal, and that began a journey that if I could take Jesus out of my heart for five seconds and put him in your heart, you would be the first to come, whether anybody else comes or not. Now, I know many of us in this room know the Lord. I know some of you watching this live streaming, you know the Lord, but there are so many of us also watching and here that say, I don't know that I know that I know that I know. And I don't know that if I died tonight, I'd go to heaven. And I really don't know that I have the Lord's guidance in my future, but I want to. So I want us to bow our heads, if you would, and I want to lead us in a prayer, and I'm going to ask you a question, and then I'm going to ask you to do whatever God tells you to do. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of preaching and sharing Thank you for the music. Thank you for everything that has made it possible for us to hear that if God be for us, who in the world could ever be against us? Lord, today, I pray you'd help everyone watching and listening, those here in the auditorium. I pray that they would answer honestly before you. Help them know no one's going to point at them and no one's going to be peeking, but help us to answer honestly to you with every head bowed every eye closed how many would say jay i know the lord i enjoyed hearing part of your story but i got my own story i know the lord i know that i know that i know his spirit bears witness to my spirit i'm a child of god if you know that tonight if it, the whistle blows and it's all over for us all of us or just one of us if you had that moment tonight how many of you could say jay I know that I have a place in heaven. I have Jesus Christ in my heart, and I know that I know that he's with me. Would you just slip your hand up high, right where you are? God bless you. And then with every head bowed, all over this room, the balcony, the highest, in every section, God bless you. With every head bowed, every eye closed, how many would say, Jay, I believe you that no one's going to point at me, and I believe you no one's going to be looking but Jay, I need Jesus as a husband, as a wife, as a young man, a young lady, mom or dad, grandparent. Jay, I need Jesus. And God spoke to me today. And he sees me. And he wants me. And he will hear me, I know. Jay, pray for me that I would not be ashamed to say I want to give my life to Jesus. Pray for me that I wouldn't be too proud to say, Lord, I give my life to you. Come into my heart. Help me, change me, strengthen me, and help me follow you. With every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking, I promise, no one will embarrass you. But I'm going to ask you to raise your hand unashamedly all over this room, if you would, please. Just slip it up high, right where you are, up in the air up in the air. God bless you, ma'am. God bless you, sir. Way up at the top, kind of wave it. It's a little harder to see way up there, but God bless you. 
Amen. We're talking about eternity. We're talking about for God or against God. There's others of us that would say, Jay, when you pray for those who need Jesus, pray for me. God's speaking to me. I want Egypt out of me. I want to get right with God. I want to get back in church. I want my life to count for him. If that's your prayer, would you slip your hand up high right where you are, all over this room, up in the air, up in the air. God bless you. God bless you. Let's stand quietly, if you would, just to stand right where we are. Lord Jesus, these next few moments, I ask that every woman, every man, every young person, every wife, every husband, those couples, I pray, Lord, those that are here today heard your voice and raised their hand and said, pray for me. I know there were some that wanted to raise their hand but didn't. And I just pray, Lord, in these next few moments, they would come and simply just come and stand at the front. And we're going to make it possible for them to get some encouragement and some help. And we're going to do everything by all the protocols, but we know that today is too important for us to walk out of here the same way we walked in. Lord, I pray for those who need to get right with you, need to get Egypt out of them, need to come. So, Lord, have your will and your way in Jesus' name. Help us come unashamedly, not wait on anyone else. Thank you for joining us for worship at Prestonwood. As you heard earlier, if you made a decision for Christ, please text Jesus to 74788. We would love to connect with you and give you these great resources to help you grow in your faith. One is a New Believer's Bible with helpful notes to help you study God's Word. The other is a book by Pastor Jack Graham on the next steps to take as you pursue this new life in Christ. As we close, I'd like to thank you for your faithful giving to support Prestonwood and the work God is doing through our ministries. If you would like to give, text the word GIVE to 74788 or visit prestonwood.org give. It's been a joy worshiping with you, and we look forward to seeing you again soon.